Well, today it's very important for us to touch on some things that aren't really spoken about in the world of athletes. And my guest joining me is Sandeep Rakra, who you wear several different hats with training people out of acceleration performance, as well as working with children who have disabilities, assisting physiotherapists, and coaching youth girl soccer. So lots of different things that you're involved with and being able to share some of your own experiences to bestow wisdom upon them. So I'm appreciative of the time you have to join me today. Thank you, Matthias. It's a pleasure to be on this podcast with you today. Well, one thing that we know is talked about a lot during this time of year is mental health and let's talk and let's talk and let's, you know, take care of your mental health and yada, yada. And the corporation says, wear the blue toque and blah, 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 or whatever it is. But like, I think one of the things that often gets lost in talking about mental health is just that you talk about it. Okay, sure. But what are you actually doing to implement change and to turn stigmas around or actually make sure people have their mental health taken care of from an emotional standpoint or a financial standpoint to ease some of these things. It's, it's a very strange concept. I know it's talk, been talked about more recently, but how do, how in general have you started to approach conversations about mental health with whether it be athletes you work with or people who are your peers now that it's become a more popular buzz term to use? Yeah, that's a great question. I think to begin, one of the most important things is just to be open and honest with yourself and the people around you. Um, there's really no reason to have a, a shield in front of us when it comes to mental health. It's something that, you know, whether it be someone who has it seems like they have everything lined up in front of themselves and everything put together. Um, anyone can really struggle with their mental health. So just having those open conversations and being okay with being vulnerable um, and knowing to yourself that it's okay to be struggling and it's okay to really not be okay. That term is thrown out a lot. Um, and I kind of want to touch on to that. So a lot of the time when people are struggling with their mental health, they feel alone. Um, and when we say you're not alone, it doesn't mean that you're not alone in this world, um, which is one aspect of it. But when people feel alone, struggling with their mental health, they often feel that no one understands what they are going through, um, which is where, you know, a lot of people struggle to say that I'm, I'm going through something right now. So I think one of the first steps is honestly reaching out to someone who you trust um, whether that be a family member, whether that be a friend, a coach, and just having that open conversation and laying things out on the table, um, you know, holding things in and bottling up emotions, bottling up how you feel um, only compounds over time. And the stress just begins to add up and add up. So detecting, you know, kind of going inwards, um, looking into yourself and looking at external factors in your life and almost viewing it as a way to take upon layer on layer um, and really diving deep into it, I think is one of the first steps um, to, to kind of go into the conversation of mental health. That's such an important thing you shared when it comes to taking action is being able to trust in somebody. And I think that's one of the, maybe <clears throat> what comes first, the chicken or the egg, the hardest things to grapple with is how do you, trust into another person or how do you feel that you can have that conversation without the worry of someone sharing it, them having an ill reaction or whatever it may be, because in some cases it could be that they don't share because they've tried or they know how reactive people are. They could be almost hyper aware of their right. surroundings. And then, so they, so they maybe bottle up even harder or try to avoid saying anything. And I think that's uh Again, it can be a bit difficult, but it, it can be. Good. Yeah, it's often a, a coping mechanism as well that we we take. I mean, it's personally something that I've struggled with in the past. Um, and, you know, having those conversations and opening up and I think relating and having those communications is what actually brought me into a place where I felt more safe. Um, and so it is it is very difficult initially 
Um, and finding those people who you trust as well can also be a challenge. So it, it really comes down to um, what makes you feel comfortable at the end of the day. When you have these conversations with your athletes, you coach youth girls in soccer, since they're of a different audience than somebody who is your peer older than you, how do you approach that conversation with people who are, you know, the youth of today or the, you know, the future adults of tomorrow, but they're obviously still not quite there yet. So what do you do to, to kind of help them dip their toes into those conversations since it's something that they're going to go through at that age, but they might not know exactly how to deal with it yet. Right. I often tell the athletes who I, I coach to meet yourself where you're at. So we often try and start 10 steps ahead of ourselves in, in many different areas, often in sports, um, in different areas of life. So I tell them, you know, where you are today is, is where we are training um, and where we want to go in terms of our destination. Um, we will work towards that, but we are taking steps to get there. Um, and everyone's path is gonna look a little bit different. I remind my athletes almost every practice that this is your training and we are doing this for you um, and this is not for anyone else. So um, really be mindful and try not to compare yourself in uh, compare yourself to the other athletes who we are training, compare yourself to who you were say a year ago as an athlete, but just trying to be honestly better than the athlete who you were yesterday. Some uh, exercises that I do with my athletes so at the beginning of practice, this is something recent that I have implemented, but the girls really seem to enjoy it, is being more mindful. So we do two things. Um, we try and focus on two things that we're gonna do well during the practice, and one thing that we need to improve on. And then at the end of the practice, during our cool down, we sit in a circle and we share. Um, and so the reason why I get them to do two things that they're doing well is for them to um, notice and appreciate, you know, the good things that they're doing during practice. Often we overlook any of the things that we are doing well, and we are very self-critical on ourselves and we only notice the bad things. And then we could have a great training session, um, be doing very well during practice or games, but one thing that goes wrong and it throws our entire mood off. Right. So I try and get them to notice two things that stand out to them that they do well and not to hyper fix it on it. Um, but just, you know, just a small thing, if they made a great shot or a good pass, just recognize that and then something to improve on. Um, and then at the end of the practice, when we go around, we we mentioned the things that we need to improve on, we take it a step further. What is an actionable step that we can take to improve for next time? So if it's someone saying, I need to uh, improve my first touch on the ball, uh, what's an actionable step? Maybe I'm gonna spend 10 minutes for every day this week just practicing uh, touches against the wall or juggling. So that way they're consistently uh, looking at inwards into themselves and being reflective. Um, and then they gain those skills, not only during sport, but outside of sport, they can implement um, reflection skills into their own life. I like how you touched upon being able to try to focus more on things that you're doing well versus things that you're not, because I don't know what the rule of thumb is exactly, but I think it's like for every one positive thing you, or you need like seven positive thoughts to cancel out one negative one, I think is how it goes. Right. Because, I think it's something like that as well. Yeah. Cause it's very easy for us to dunk on ourselves, you know, or, or even if it's easy to criticize other people. And because again, that's like a reflection of us projecting our insecurities mm -hmm. internally onto other people. It's not that we actually think that other person is bad or they're not good at this or they're annoying or whatever. It's like part of us feels that way about ourselves. It's it's all 100%. just like looking into a mirror, you know? And I think that's uh yeah. that's that's a really interesting approach to help athletes at that age. And at least in the short while since you've implemented, how have you found that it's gone so far? Honestly, I think it's gone great. The girls love doing it. Um, the first time we did it, they said that we should be doing this after every practice. Um, and you also notice a shift in their mood and the connection that they have with each other. Um, I often find that, especially with young female athletes, there can be a lot of tension between each other on the teams. And it's quite normal, especially at that, at that age. 
Um, but doing things where they are able to connect and bond with each other, um, even outside of sport, we also don't just do strict um, training on the ball and strict um, strength and conditioning work, but we also try and add in some fun games for them to play. Um, so they're connecting with each other a little bit more um, and get them, you know, laughing and, and enjoying and having a good time. So I, I think that exercise has been great to begin with. And I think there's so many different layers that you can add to it. Um, we've recently started doing meditation at the end of practice um, and trying to visualize their goals and teaching diaphragmatic breathing um, to help regulate the nervous system and just calm the nerves outside of practice in the game. How helpful would this have been if you had learned about these things when you were playing soccer that age? Oh, it would have been much, much more helpful if I had this stuff when I was 15, 16 years old. I think it would have honestly taken my game to a different level than what I had played. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful and fortunate that I can go back to the, the club team that I played for and be able to inspire um, and help some of the young athletes who I was once in their shoes. Well, I mean, it's, it is looking back on those moments, I'm sure it can garner feelings of frustration because of the fact that in hindsight, it's always 2020 and, and we as human beings can sometimes be filled with regret or with feelings of contempt that we didn't get to experience what people now have the benefit of having at their disposal. But at the same time, mm -hmm. I think that the benefit of that is that you can correct the past by using the tools you have in the present. And maybe if, Hey, like I wasn't able to take advantage of this technique mentally or this technique physically, I can at least now coach this to the next generation rather than keep people stuck in the same cycles that held me back because I don't want them to be better than I was. And maybe that's part of the, exactly. the doggy dog mentality that can sometimes creep <laughs> into a negative area when it comes to, being a high level athlete. Yeah, definitely. Even something that you had mentioned before talking about athletes being hard on themselves. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? And what are some of the approaches that you've taken to whether it be help your players with that, or even just help yourself with that after your athletic career? Yeah, I think a lot of athletes are very hard on themselves, one, because of the expectations and pressure that we have. Uh, I know personally I've dealt with uh, a lot of struggles because of the personal expectations that I've placed on myself um, and also expectations from others. And that's not to say that um, it's not a good thing to have expectations. I think it's great to, you know, set the precedent and have good standards for yourself. But there's also an upper limit to that too much of having high expectations can also backfire in one sense, because um, when we don't reach those expectations, uh, we often feel like we're falling short of ourselves and then we can, we can beat ourselves up. So we're not really going to get to the next level if we are constantly being too hard on ourselves and beating ourselves up. Um, I think it's very important to be compassionate towards yourself when you do make mistakes and you do have those failures because Failure is a part of the journey. There is no success really that comes without um, failure in the process. And I think for a lot of athletes, it's about finding enjoyment and love in the journey that they are part of um, and finding their why. So this kind of goes into to ways that they can um, mitigate being hard on themselves is, um, you know, finding that internal strength and finding that internal reason why to keep going. Um, I think, you know, having those reasons to keep going often will help us push through those hard moments. Um, another thing I think that athletes struggle with a lot is grind culture. Um, a lot of athletes feel like they need to constantly, constantly be doing more, constantly be working. Um, and that can, can lead to burnout. And burnout is a real thing. Um, it affects our sleep. It affects our diet. Um, it affects you know, our performance in game, it even affects our, our ability to focus in school and in everyday day-to-day -day life. So um, taking a step back and, you know, recognizing when you do need a break, I say this all the time to my athletes and I say it to myself now, 
you have to meet yourself where where you are at where you are at right now you are not 10 steps ahead of yourself so you're not who you were um two weeks ago even um if you're struggling with an injury be mindful with that uh, i also think that um fear of judgment fear of disappointment um from self and other pressures so whether it be family coaches uh, that's another thing personally that I have struggled with and that I see in a lot of the athletes um, who I coach as well uh, that can also lead to um, different struggles within within athletes mental health. Um, so I think that you know recognizing that it's okay to make mistakes and and moving on from those and accepting them wholeheartedly uh, is one thing that I, I really try and emphasize with my athletes as well. I feel like that's something that, again, can apply all, of course, to more than just athletes, mm -hmm. but thinking about how to meet yourself where you're at and balancing, balancing the, the expectations that you have versus the reality of being a human being. What were some of the things that you have done to make you feel that you are taking care of yourself? as much as you need to, and also that you're not using it as an excuse necessarily to slough off or to reverse some of the progress that you've made when mm -hmm. you're in a flow state? No, I think that's a great question. Um, personally, there was a period of my time where I felt I was, everything was a setback. And in those moments, I could not recognize that these quote unquote setbacks or these failures that I'm experiencing right now are actually um, in place to help me set me free um, and to provide me different perspective on what my situation is and how to move forward. So I think one thing is um, having a perspective shift. So our, our thoughts, our feelings and our behaviors are all connected in a feedback loop. So, um, you know, taking action towards a goal taking action towards a step, um, it, it often has a domino effect for us to keep going. So for me, when I was in a period where I felt like I couldn't do anything, it was about starting very, very small. So recognizing my small wins um, and building small habits on top of that. Um, it wasn't about overloading myself. It wasn't about um, you know feeling like I need to do too much. I think that was one thing that myself and a lot of other people struggle with, especially um, in this day and age, is feeling that we constantly need to be on the go. So slowing down actually was one thing that helped me a lot. Um, slowing down and having the power of pausing. Um, I think reflection and, and being still uh, is very important. And when things are chaotic, you're not really going to be able to have those moments of creativity um, and moments of good reflection. So, so really taking a step back and um, telling myself that I, I really cannot pour from an empty cup. So recognizing that being or self care is not selfish, um, and taking time out for myself, um, whether that be from sports, whether that be from school or from work, um, getting myself back to a spot that I need to, um, so that I can show up better not only for myself, but for others in the world as well, um, is something that that I really emphasized on during my healing journey. Um, and also to mention that my healing journey um, and many of our healing journeys is not a linear thing. There are so many ups and downs. Um, it can really be a roller coaster. So giving yourself that grace and that compassion, um, knowing that you don't always have to be moving forward, forward, forward constantly. Um, and it's not going to be an upward slope. There's going to be times where you dip back down, but then you pick your stuff up and you get up again. And from those moments that you fall, um, you reflect and you learn from it. So I think, um, you know, pausing and, and slowing down has been a, a very beneficial tool that I have used for myself. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is uh, one of the standards that is used across um, many different treatments. 
And so um, implementing different practices from that. So that that goes back to what I was mentioning earlier about how your thoughts, feelings and behaviors are all kind of in a feedback loop. Um, and so once we start taking those small, small actionable steps um, and feeling and truly believing in ourselves that we are doing well um, and that we can move forward, I think that um, results in a lot of momentum that can that can move us forward out of those tough positions. One thing that I thought of with what you were saying is this quote I heard recently related to failure and fear of judgment. It's not that we fear failing. It's that we fear the judgment that will come from others when we fail. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's a very true quote. And I can speak to that, that it, that's something that I've experienced myself. Um, so I think going back to that quote, actually, and recognizing that no one understands you and what you go through except for yourself, right? We are all our own human beings. We are all very unique. And actually recognizing like, yes, I am a human being. I'm not a robot. Like I can't be doing all these things. I'm not a machine. So taking a step back and actually recognizing that you know, what other people think of me, their judgments actually do not matter. At the end of the day, like it's it's your life, right? And you make choices that are good for yourself and move forward with that. Um, I think comparison is also another big thing that comes in with judgment as well. I think they're very um, intertwined and especially with the younger athletes and younger generation now. Um, it's huge. Like comparison is something that we do subconsciously as human beings. Um, from a young age and even from childhood um, we often have like parents and family members comparing us to siblings or to other people in in the community um, and now with with social media it's it's you can compare yourself to anyone at just the click of a button so I think recognizing that we the, the only person you can really compare yourself to is yourself right and that's not even comparing yourself to who you were um, you know, two weeks ago, a year ago, comparing yourself to who you are right now um, and trying to be better from this moment on. That's it's a topic that I touch on a lot with my athletes. And again, I'm touching on it again, that we just have to meet ourselves where you are right now. One of the, one of the first things that comes to mind when you talk about us, you know, the thief is a comparison or it's comparison is a thief of joy. That's how it goes. Mm -hmm. and, um. I can't help but think of the impacts that our upbringing and our family and the culture that we live in has on comparing ourselves to others. And I know even it, it exists amongst many cultures in the world. And I'm sure even, you know, the, the one clip I think of is there's a, one of the a throwback to if the listener would even remember one of the very original Just Rain videos he talks about, you know, like with Daisy parents in school. And he's like, you know, he's like back in the days, like he's like, and our parents would compare each other, like the homies would compare Pokemon cards. And it just shows like, <laughs> the mom and the dad going back and forth about like, yeah, like my son got accepted to Harvard. My son got a, called by Obama. Yeah. My son's going to Mars. And my son, and then just, they go back and forth throwing these, these one ups on each other. And I feel like, of course it's exaggerated, but at the same time, like the purpose of that humor is to show, to shed kind of some insight as to insight as to like, you know, like kids who grow up in, you know, a, a South Asian household, like they ex are, they experience that a lot. Or if they make jokes about people who grew up in another part of Asia or even in Europe, I know too, it's something that I've experienced. Mm -hmm. And whenever you, you always get compared to someone better than you, but then when you compare, when you try to rebuttal, or re refuted by comparing yourself to someone who's worse than you, then mm -hmm. then it's invalid. It doesn't count, right? It's only only when you're compared to somebody who's better than you, then that's when you're not good enough. But when you, hey, yeah. you're better than uh, John or Jane, well, you're already better. So it doesn't matter. Forget about it. So it's just, I don't know. It's a, it's a very unfortunate conundrum. I feel like we've been exposed to as kids. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think, like, again, you can't change your childhood experience. You can only go forth and be like, hey, like, I'm here right now how can I make myself better than I was yesterday versus because again, if you, if you compare yourself to other people, like you'll just live miserably into perpetuity. 
100%. I love that you brought up Just Rain. Like, shout out Just Rain. I hope you hope you come back with more videos. But Brown community misses you. <laughs> um, no, but I 100% I agree with everything you had just mentioned. Um, I think that, you know, the process that we go through often as kids um, with the, the comparison and, and growing up in a society like today, um, it can be it can be quite difficult. Um, so having that moment of reflection just towards yourself um, and being OK with yourself, I think, is super important, especially for our young athletes. If you were to give advice to somebody who, let's say, wanted to do whether it be training or whether it be they're an athlete and you could look back, let's say to your early twenties or to when you just first turned 20, what advice mm -hmm. would you give to somebody who is in a position like you were at that age? I feel like there's, there's so many things that I could pick upon. Um, in terms of training, I think I would tell people that, you know, take things not to, not too, too quickly, I would say. Um, I think for myself, when I was at that age, I'm, I'm 23 right now, so I'm still in my early 20s, actually. But when I was, you know, 18, 17, I, I just wanted to go and I wanted to um, try and get to the next level. I wanted to be, um, you know, the strongest person that I could be. And I think, you know, moving too fast and, and growing up, um, you know, around a lot of people who had a similar mindset and were in that sort of state, um, it, it took a big toll on my body. Um, I actually started training um, in the sense where I, I wanted to reach different PRs in the gym. And um, I, I stepped almost outside of the training of soccer for a while when I took a break from it. Um, and that, that kind of tore apart my body. So I think in that sense, um, I would tell people, you know, don't, don't try and go to guns blazing on your training um, and that your, your body doesn't forget when you train, you know, like a lot of people think like, oh, you know, if I miss a day of training, like I feel guilty about it. Right. And I, I used to feel that all the time. Um, but I'm like, no, like I, I trained like three or four times this week. My body doesn't forget that I, I just did that work and it needs that rest. So prioritizing your rest and your sleep, and your, your nutrition, um, getting outside and trying different types of training um, I think would be my advice to myself before. Um, now I try different, so many different types of training and it's also great for my mental health because I don't feel like I need to constantly be doing the same thing. Um, I try different types of classes. Um, I, I recently picked up kickboxing, which I really like and um, different forms of martial arts. Muay Thai has been really cool. Um, I really enjoy swimming now um, and just trying different outdoor activities. So you don't have to feel confined to who you are and say your sport. Um, I think that's another thing that I I had labeled myself almost as I'm this athlete. Um, I have this outcome that I want to reach and I want to do everything I can to get there. And then when I didn't get there, when I didn't reach the expectations of myself, I felt like I fell short. So that's another thing. Um, try not to label yourself as I am this person. I am this athlete because we are so much more than that as human beings we have so much more to offer um also just outside of our sport itself right so recognizing there are many different avenues that we can tap into tap into our own potential um whether that be in our own body um you know i've, I've adapted my training so much i think you have done also a lot of similar training um through alliance as well uh and uh it, it has made the world of a difference um and also taking a step to recognize like I'm, I'm not only just a soccer player. Uh, I'm not only just, you know, a strength coach. I'm not only just this, but I'm, I'm so much more in other areas of my life as well. And I can explore and try new things. And if I'm not great at it, and if I don't do well, that's okay. It's a learning experience and I can learn and grow from that. I'm just trying to have fun and enjoy the process, right? We often view the destination. And this is another thing that I would also tell myself is, don't be so hyper-focused on the destination, right? We we often look at our next goal post. Um, we look at the next thing that we want to accomplish without recognizing, 
hey, I'm actually in the journey right now. Like, this is the dream that I was working towards. Um, and so that's another thing I would tell myself is just recognizing that the work that you're putting in right now is the work that, you know, leads to the success. Um, and the destination, that's just the top of the mountain, right? And it's like when you're on a hike, you know, you get to the top of or the end of the hike and you're like, okay, nice, we made it. But it was the journey that you took on the hike. The hike itself was actually, you know, the good part of it. Um, it's just the ending is just the cherry on top. So without all of that work, without all of that, that time and effort that you put in, it wouldn't feel so great at the end of the hike if you were just given, you know, the end of the destination. So trying to recognize that too is also like enjoying your process and falling love falling in love with the process because if you if you hate the process it's gonna be very hard to grow so that's that's long-winded answer but the advice I would give to myself even from just a few years ago two things that jump into mind a great quote that uh for one of the early earliest podcast guests I ever had Angus Reed who was a center for the BC Alliance for almost 10 years I believe it was he gave a TED talk actually at a TEDx event in Vancouver about why we need high school football. And he was talking about this concept of athletes losing their identity and feeling lost. Mm -hmm. And he said, it doesn't matter what you do. It matters how you do it. And every, every time that I ever struggle with trying to fixate on an identity and we want to belong, I always remember that quote because it tells us that you can never have your work ethic taken away from you. But right. being a soccer player, being a football player, basketball player, those things can always end, like no matter 100%. what. And mm. the other thing I think of is actually funny enough, a video that Matt had sent me mm-hmm. um, about this, this Japanese like proverb that talks about focusing on the process oh, and yes. trans- translated to English. It goes like, oh, snail, climb Mount <laughs> Fuji slowly, slowly. And I sat there and listened to like the whole explanation psychologically about why it's like, think of a snail climbing Mount Fuji. Like that's insane. Mm-hmm. Like how the hell could you get to the top as a snail? But having said that, of course, the point of doing something is to arrive at a place. So you don't just do it for the sake of doing it. But right. having said that, you still need to understand that 99.9% of the time is spent getting there, not being there. So if you hate trying to get there, you can make progress, but like you said, it's going to be so difficult. That's, that's, um, yeah, it, it's a crucial part of being able to make progress and yeah. change and become a better person is to actually enjoy doing the things that it takes to get there, not just closing your eyes and wishing yourself there. Cause then it won't be satisfying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To touch on that. I think another thing is finding enjoyment in the healing process as well. Um, and taking accountability for what has happened um, and how to move forward. Uh, a lot of the times, the things that have happened in our life, um, whether that be through childhood or adolescence, um, we're not really in our control. And it almost became conditioned into us. So taking accountability to to heal yourself, I think, is is super important. And finding enjoyment in that process as well will make the healing process honestly, a lot more smoother. Um, Not that it's ever really smooth, but it will, it will allow you to, I guess, tap into a different area of your healing process as well. Well, I appreciate the time that you shared with me today on this podcast, Sandeep. It was great getting to dive more into taking actionable steps as to how to take care of your mental health, avoid burnout, and not get too fixated on being critical and being strapped to one identity as an athlete because we are always more than that and it take and it doesn't just need to be said by lebron during basketball commercials you know what i mean so well thank you very much for having me on this podcast it was truly a pleasure